All right, everyone. First off, hi, I'm Kat. I'm Stark's CEO, um, one of two founders. I'm a designer by trade and training, now CEO. Um, here with me uh, is Beth, who is signing for us, or you know, interpreting for us, uh, Ben, who is our chief design officer, and Treg, who is our product designer and community design advocate. Get a little wave. Um, just on the housekeeping front, this webinar is meant to summarize and discuss our white paper. There are many points that you'll probably notice throughout uh, where you can probably safely say, this will be a breakout webinar. And the answer is yes, we're going to do a number of these. Um, the reality is that we cannot take a white paper and distill years of how to operationalize accessibility uh, in just 45 minutes. So naturally there will be more that comes with it. Um, and then of course, uh, we will do, we will save room uh, at the end for Q and A. Feel free to drop comments, questions, thoughts into the chat or Q and A ahead of that. Um, if you feel like DMing one of us uh, privately, if you're more comfy about that, totally okay. With that said, let's get going. All right. So um, to kick us off and before we get into um, the solution part of the webinar, um, Kat, why don't we take a moment to talk a little bit about the macro picture of where the world is at, um, regulatory um, trends, as well as just technology trends overall um, that we've outlined in the white paper, but are probably a good anchor point for us to discuss further. Sure. Um, let's go through. I think we have some bullets up. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, you know, massively accelerating deployment of software. Um, that's a nice word jumble for there's a massive acceleration happening right now in technology uh, with a number of different areas of that. One being the obvious that we have to mention AI. Um, it's accelerating, it's augmenting, um, it's assisting. Uh, that's something we fundamentally believe will play a large role in the world of accessibility, but also fundamentally believe humans need to always remain in the driver's seat. Otherwise we remove disabled people from the forefront um, and ignore the realities that come with them. Um, despite the massive acceleration uh, that's happening through AI and a spectrum of other technologies, 96% um, of the internet is still inaccessible. And that's barely moved since it was first reported on. Um, that came out you know, years ago. It's barely moved. Um, with that said, it's important to note it is moving. And that's really important to acknowledge that the work that has been done previously is now starting to come to light. And the reality is that these things take time, but technology can actually assist that. Now, the problem is that there's a lot of things coming to a head. One is with the acceleration of technology and us becoming very much so more online, disabled people need to be able to access the world's latest innovation, but they're blocked from doing so. And add to that for companies, there's regulatory pressure that's increasing, not only in the European Union or EU with the European Accessibility Act, but also in Canada, the United States, Australia. And you know we see that now uh, with the number of lawsuits, which is certainly a metric that we pay attention to, um, that number has doubled since 2018. And if you look at the data, that's increasing. Um, so companies need to respond to the realities that their customers can't, are not getting value out of their solutions. And there's regulatory pressure, um, you know, around the corner um, that they need to adhere to. Um, for all of you that are here that you need to adhere to. Um, and the problem with that, though, is even when these companies are very much so aware of that, of what needs to be done, and that this, very, this is very much so something that needs to be uh, and should be tackled, um, the reality for companies, for many companies, that they're underinvested, accessibility in general is underinvested in, um, and the teams within are uneducated and one is a byproduct of the other. Um, and so 
fixing or filling out that accessibility education gap, as we call it, is something we've focused a lot on, um, uh, you know, over the last years and specifically with our customers, because until you can change the organization culturally, even tiny bits of progress, you can't actually work on what it takes to operationalize accessibility at scale, for instance, in the enterprise or in smaller companies, it doesn't matter. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think in general, um, you know, that's that's not only backed by uh, market research, but it's but all of this is driven by regulatory pressure. And so companies need to be, respond. You know, it's not just the. Let me think of how to word this. I wish we lived in a world where. This being the right thing to do is what moved companies internally. I wish. But over the course of the last years, one thing we recognize is that that's not the only thing that moves a company internally. Um, it's not just the right thing to do that shifts it. It's what also moves the currency, right? You look at a lot of these enterprise organizations, they're planning out their stock price three years in advance. And so you need to account for the fact that they're going to be very conscious, very cognizant of the moves that they make, knowing this will impact them either positively and negatively. So coming up with and pressing emphasis on why, again, I, why this is critical for them to adhere to and acknowledge, accept and operationalize. Um, we've seen that with privacy and security as well, um, but where Star comes into play in the, the research that we've done is that these traditional approaches fail to deliver the desired outcomes for these companies. And so the question becomes, well, Kat, you're, you're saying all this, how do we actually get there? And that's a core of what we you know, emphasize in the white paper. So um, I will jump, Ben, you wanna take over? Sure, yeah. So um, basically summarizing what Kat just briefly walked us through is, um, we had a really um, critical moment in time in terms of developing um, software, delivering digital services, where um, a lot of mega trends are coming together from aging populations to accelerating deployment of software to regulatory pressure to ensure that that software is actually um, accessible for everyone. Um, and also the reality is while we've made some in inward progress, um, the traditional approaches to how to get there have, in fact, not delivered the desired outcomes, meaning 96% of the internet is still inaccessible, and we haven't even accounted for, um, in that number, typically any other digital services that you access in, in other um, formats and on other, other devices. Um, now, at the same time, as we were doing our research and, and building out more of, of the Stark platform, we we're actually really encouraged that we've seen this playbook before. Um, as Kat mentioned, um, when we're looking back a few years uh, around privacy and security, um, we can make the same case um, for accessibility, where on the one hand, it's morally the right thing to do, yet only once the regulatory pressure was high enough, did we see companies actually move on those topics. Um, and so that is what we're laying out in the white paper in detail. And we'll walk you through uh, on a high level in this webinar, and then we have follow on webinars um, to, to dive deeper into each of those points. So all of that to say, how do we approach managing accessibility with the same rigor as privacy and security? Um, well, first we need to accept that accessibility is not only a moral argument to make, but it is also a non-negotiable quality requirement for software. We need to move the conversation away from just a compliance checkbox toward a quality checkbox that is built into all parts of um, the software development process, but also more broadly, all work that a company does, including things like marketing material and so on and so forth. Um, with that, we can move away and need to move away from a reactive disjointed approach, which most of the current accessibility tooling is still very much so built on, meaning you test at the very end of the development process, which is very costly once you find issues to fix. It's very disjointed and delayed because you're relying a lot on external audits and um, consultancy services. 
um, to basically then produce reports that are outdated in the moment they're being created. And we need to move to a more proactive, deeply integrated approach where along the way, in real time, the individuals in a company can check quickly and easily and then fix accessibility issues as they are produced um, or identified. And um, in turn, also managers can see in real time the progress that is being made and manage resources accordingly. Um, so the, pro the, the concept that has really become the um, superior approach here is uh, what's called continuous accessibility. Um, initially coined mostly coming out of the development um, sphere where we already have continuous integration, continuous development. Um, but as we were doing research and spending time with a lot of our customers, especially, especially at scale, we realized that continuous accessibility needs to go way beyond just the development process and needs to touch every single department of a company. Um, and we'll get to this in a little bit um, later and we'll have a separate um, deep dive into this as a separate webinar. Um, in order for us to even deliver that, when you assess both the existing maturity models and scales, as well as the tooling that's in the market, for the most part, you realize uh, in order to make this a reality, just like with privacy and security, it requires an entirely new platform approach to support the execution of this approach because the tooling is all built on an entirely different reactive approach. And so um, what we're going to talk about in a second is what does this platform look like and how do you deliver value in a measurable way for the business along the entire development process. And that is how you're actually delivering impact on the accessibility quality metrics um, at scale um, in a way that it serves both the business and the customers. So to dive deeper into what a platform like this looks like, and by now, for those of you who have already um, had a chance to look at the white paper, you might've already read further. But to give you all a understanding of what it looks like to take a, a page out of the privacy and security playbook and apply it to accessibility, um, we will describe broadly the platform approach that we are taking and the way we believe, the only way we believe a path forward for accessibility at scale looks like. Um, and what we'll start with is the, the bottom part um, here, which shows you on the tooling side, um, embedded tooling along all parts of um, a company's work that's being produced. So not only are we looking at design and development, which is a classic uh, digital accessibility tooling uh, on, the, on the development side, typically sits there. We're also looking at integrated um, tooling in, for example, marketing. We're producing typically a lot of marketing and sales material that needs to be um, checked on an ongoing basis um, and need, need to be accessible. But also more broadly speaking, and you will see this um, in the white paper, we're talking also um, processes being embedded in HR to ensure you have um, policies in place for hiring, for continuous education of people around um, accessibility. Um, and all of that wants to be measured and, and integrated um, in the rest of the way you do business in real time as a modern agile um, company at scale. And frankly, at this point, every company is or has to become a software company. Uh, so this is not a um, industry specific problem. This is in fact a solution that applies across industries and scales. Um, so now all of that integrated tooling um, needs to be connected to a platform, a platform that can handle inputs and outputs in real time. So as issues get discovered, they ideally get rectified in real time. And then they can be analyzed. These signals can be analyzed according to various, uh, what we call frameworks. Um, you can see that um, in the security compliance side, for example, with frameworks like SOC 2 or GDPR. The same thing applies to accessibility where we have um, already in the Stark platform, our Stark Universal Accessibility Framework, which takes the best practices from across the industry and markets and brings them in an actionable set of what we call controls that companies can adhere to and in turn um, measure their progress in terms of 
um, establishing accessibility throughout every part of the company. But also we've implemented the W3C's maturity model with its controls, which is still in a draft phase. And you can imagine that as um, regulatory environments change, as companies might end up having their own um, guidelines and frameworks, you will be able to apply all of those to um, the data that you're generating. And then on top of that, generate real-time reports and insights so that your managers can be held accountable to delivering certain business results, as well as your ICs doing the actual work um, can actually get the insight and direction needed to um, fix those things as they um, occur in the moment, rather than having to wait for the next quarterly audit or you know um, any sort of um, testing at the very end of the development um, or delivery process. So that's roughly giving you a sense for how um, all of this um, translates into the platform that we're that we're building out that you can already um, start using today and where we're seeing things going um, in the future. Now, um, just to briefly touch on, and we will have a separate webinar on the topic of measuring accessibility, maturity and progress within an organization based on this new um, approach and this new framework. But just to give you a sense for um, the dimensions that we're looking at when it comes to truly assessing the progress um, of an organization. Um, when you follow the more traditional reactive approach, you are very limited into um, the heights that you can reach in terms of bringing accessibility into your organization because it's very limited, very narrowly scoped, typically somewhere at the end of the development process where you're doing some code scanning, you might have some checklists that people go through on the cultural behavioral side um, and you might be able to establish some kind of core policies to make sure you're you're complying with certain parts. But at the end of the day, because it is so reactive and typically very narrowly scoped, um, there's only so far you can go. Whereas when you look at example two, um, when you're following a proactive approach, because you're much deeper integrated in all parts of the company, you have real-time data and reports you can generate, and you have the tooling embedded directly where the work is done across all departments and functions, you can move the needle much further and establish not only something that is proactive and quick to respond, but also that is sustainable because it ultimately is just in accessibility is embedded as part of how you do business as a quality measurement and a general quality indicator uh, for um, how uh, products are delivered. And compliance, in fact, is just a um, end result um, in the end. Now, um, just to um, make sure, and I see Kat, your hand is raised. I'll pause real quick if, if you wanna um, jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna say that when we look at the core pillars of an organization, the core compliance pillars being a, a, a company's internal PSA, privacy, security, accessibility. We even see now that uh, on the privacy and security front, that they're starting to take some notes out of this playbook in terms of accessibility as well, and trying to figure out where they can even shift further left you know, with regard to uh, being proactive. Uh, and again, compliance is a byproduct of that. Um, but it's good to see that in every regard, it is almost a, the, the, the playbook or the formula is very modular and it's agnostic of company size. It's agnostic of type of compliance. It's very straightforward. And instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, it's trying to figure out how to put accessibility in a place where it follows these same pillars that we know work. Um, the only difference being a major one in that privacy and security are not something that the customer largely is even aware they're experiencing when it's removed from them. Accessibility is very in a customer's face and drastically impacts them. Accessibility is a proxy for user experience. And so even more so, I I'm glad that these other compliance pillars are, are noticing that this is something that works and for once using accessibility as a model for how things should be done. And that's how we move it forward as well. Yeah, and so um, now that we've um, at least illuminated some of those four um, considerations, um, as well as the, the macro um, trends that are, that are driving all of this, um, we wanna at least start touching on, well, how do you get started? So how do we actually establish accessibility in this 
in this new expanded way where it becomes just a um, matter of how you build and deliver um, services and software at scale um, and how it becomes a quality requirement. And so based on the re research we've done, um, the, the comparisons we can draw from the privacy and security side and what we've seen actually work in um, our own customer base that is a, that is already establishing um, this proactive um, accessibility approach is first, you need to have the right tooling in place. The good news about that is that you can even start just in one part of the company and you can make actual meaningful measurable progress. We see this typically, and, and that is as most of you uh, know, Stark um, probably um, has started in the design space where for the longest time, um, the conversation was always around shifting left, but it wasn't until Stark came along and delivered the actual tooling that was uh, enabling designers to um, make those changes in real time and measure the improvements in real time that um, the actual cultural shift left started to happen. So making sure that you have tooling in place that enables real time measurement. We're so used to anything from Google Analytics for all our marketing work to um, real-time measurements of code and code deployment. Um, for accessibility though, up until um, we started rolling out the Star platform, we didn't have that true real-time measurement along the entire development process. Um, now with that, you can in fact then start empowering your ICs to do things better, to make sure that they are as part of their typical design and development process, check early, check often, because now they have the tools to go and find those issues and fix them so ideally, as you then start measuring on a management level, you can already see how less issues carry over from, let's say, the design phase into the code phase, which ultimately drastically reduces the number of issues that you will find at the very end of the development and deployment process. And that is, of course, much cheaper, much better, much faster to get the market than if you were to rectify all of the, these things in a reactive way at the end. And then on the flip side, once you've empowered your ICs, you also want to make sure you incentivize your managers um, to hit certain goals. Um, and you can do that because you have, with uh, the Stark platform, uh, real-time reports um, that produce actual numbers across a variety of different assets along the development process that you can hold them accountable to. Now, holding people accountable and, and incentivizing them, of course, make uh, requires that you set clear um, OKRs and KPIs for what that exactly means. Um, and that is where we're moving away from pure um, check boxes to um, now that we have real-time reports and insights, we can actually look at what is the benchmark, a healthy benchmark for how many um, accessibility issues are carried from design to development or early phase of development and late stages of development to the live product. And once you have established your benchmark, uh, you can now actually establish goals to say, okay, we want to reduce these numbers by X percent in the next quarter. You can then start building your quarterly business reviews and your reporting to stakeholders um, based on that and in turn start reporting just like it would with any other um, quality requirement internally on a monthly, quarterly um, basis and, and show the meaningful progress that you're making. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier, Compliance reporting is just a result of that because now you're doing things in a proactive way, combining all of those results that you're already getting um, into a compliance report and having that available in real time at any point in time with updated information is not only just a nice to have, but it's also becoming then a new standard on how you how you do the compliance reporting in itself. Um, and just to sum that up, we've talked briefly about this, this concept of frameworks. Um, once you have um, our compliance center in place, you will be able in real time to see which parts of the company are already adhering to certain policies, uh, fulfilling certain controls, and you have the evidence attached to it and the control owner uh, named so that you can get a broad overview on how your AHR department is doing in terms of accessibility policies, how your product department is doing, how marketing is doing, and so on and so forth so that you have now that integrated tooling all bubble up into one central place where you can manage your compliance um, part of the accessibility um, work in, in one central place. All right, 
So that was um, the quick run through on the solution as mentioned now a few times, we will have deep dives on each of those parts to really get you uh, a good idea of how you um, execute and establish this at your company. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to you Kat for a quick sum up that will then carry us into um, the Q and A. Thank you, thank you. Also, I just wanna give us a little praise of how well we're tracking on time. I'm going to try and get this done in two minutes. So then we really do have 15 minutes left for Q&A. So let's do this real quick. Uh, so accessibility transformation is a trillion dollar business. Um, and it's time to act now for a spectrum of reasons, right? If your products aren't accessible, they can't be sold. And that's the reality. Um, you're going to see this. You're not going to garner customer value. What's good for customer value is good for stakeholder value. And that's how you move things forward. Um, there will eventually be a block on that with you not being able to sell products if they're not accessible. The only way that you get there is through shifting left. Um, however, there is an entire process that needs to be reshifted or, or shaped in your company to ensure that you're shipping properly, you're shipping accessibly, and the entire product development pipeline um, is, uh, is set up for success with this, all right? This isn't a single discipline issue just for engineers or just for product managers. It's an entire product development pipeline issue. And if you're going to have something efficient in place, start at the beginning. Anything else is just inefficient and expensive. One thing that we haven't touched on, which we need to, test and fix in real time, end to end. Everyone involved, testing, with disabled people, understanding how they're utilizing your product. Um, and the reality is uh, in you know some companies, especially uh, if stats say that one in seven people are disabled, you can probably turn to your right or left and know that they have some form of a disability. Turn to, to your individuals, understand more about your colleagues and the people you're testing with. Um, the bigger your company gets, the more you're going to accrue accessibility debt. This is, this is not new to design debt or tech debt. If accessibility is a proxy for user experience, it's going to permeate. That accessibility debt will permeate throughout the entire workflow from first design draft and code output to inefficient ticketing in your favorites like Jira or Linear or whatever the case may be. Um, the bigger your company gets, the more products that are in flight, uh, the more you're going to need to actually retrofit that is the most expensive. So if you can start now, even with the smallest project, shift left and start tacking off that, that accessibility debt. Uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. Uh, I don't know if you all watched this, but at the, I think it was uh, AWS uh, conference, um, uh, Werner Fogels, who is the CTO of Amazon, and he's got a few other fancy titles. Uh, he said, I think security, compliance, and accessibility are non-negotiable. And for someone at that company of that size uh, to get on stage and say that was a very, very big uh, round of applause um, and praise for accessibility to be up there with the others. Um, pause here, open it up for Q&A. Um, I know that there's a, a couple in here. Um, so uh, one of the questions that was early on, I, I asked for a follow-up, but I didn't get anything just yet. What action should require uh, should be required to overtake this problem? I clarified uh, to understand what problem in particular that individual is referring to because there's a there's a lot of problems happening in tandem. Uh, so uh, waiting for a clarification there. Then um, got another question from Leonardo. The idea of the platform for accessibility is very interesting, but ideally, who or whom will govern that platform? And what ideally will be the governance model? My follow-up question to that, we can tackle it, but I would want to know whether or not anything we spoke about helps shed a, shed a bit more light on how we're thinking about that. Um, in terms of who or who will govern the platform, I assume you're referring to Stark's platform, um, but I'm going to... I'll wait and see if anything comes through the chat. Uh, ah. uh, let's see, nope. 
I'll wait for that answer. If not, we can answer it, you know, on our own with assumptions. But uh, another question from Brian. Hey, Brian. Uh, Brian Hinton, will there be a recording of this session for those who couldn't make it? Yes, we are recording. We will send it up, uh, send it in a follow up to anybody who uh, saved a seat, registered, or attended. You'll get that after this uh, at some point. Um, okay, Ben, you want to tackle the the governance platform? You want to jam on that together? Sure. Any of us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think. Um, the short answer is it really depends on your company and, and where your company is in terms of, you know, general government governance set up already. Um, what I can speak to briefly, um, both from my own experience being in large tech companies and, and running large programs, but also um, what we've seen in, in with some of our um, larger customers, there is no there is no one answer. Um, sometimes we have really strong accessibility um, teams already at a company that uh, very much so already uh, is uh, embracing this proactive approach that we've outlined. And in that case, often what we find is that those are the folks that are um, driving the overall um, implementation and adoption of this process. And in turn, also, um the setup of the platform now the beautiful thing of the platform approach in general um and and you'll you'll see this in um the white paper certainly is that it's very modular so you can if you and this is this is another example where let's say you have a company that is just getting started broadly with accessibility um but the design organization is already very much um in favor of you know adopting tooling adopting a platform um, it's very modular and in turn, it can be adopted in one department and then scale to other departments over time. That is generally the beauty of these modern compliance platforms, as you see it even in the security and privacy space too. So um, I know this is not a um, concrete answer. It's like, this is the only way, which is also not the reality that we find in, in, in companies because companies are organic, things, organisms that that grow in, in very different ways. And um, what we found is that this approach actually lends itself well to be adopted from all different directions. And in turn, then from, from you know, one place start influencing other parts of the company because you can hook in um, tooling from different departments and generate reporting. You can apply different types of frameworks for different parts of the organization. Um, and that way you you can, as the organization grows, um, the platform can adapt and uh, adapt and and grow with them. So I hope that gives at least shed some light on um, you know governance um, and what we've seen more than happy to you know get more concrete, but it really depends on the type of organization and what's already in place. Thanks, Ben. Treg, you want to take the next one from Michelle? Yeah. Uh, so there was a question from Michelle that says, uh, do you have any tips for building the business case for prioritizing accessibility? In particular, any data sources that can provide evidence to make the strong the case as strong as it can be? Uh, yes. So the uh, for actual like just raw data, if you want um, data on accessibility as a whole, the WebAIM million uh, survey it's the it's a report on the top 1 million web pages on the internet uh great place to just pull raw data to start making a case for how big the problem is um the uh uh data point which i'm actually not sure the source cat could probably give the source uh but the the data point that we've been talking about recently and i believe it's in the white paper uh is that the the disability uh, segmentation is a market the size of China. Um, so if you care about having a lot of customers, uh, it makes sense to <laughs> make your product uh, accessible. Um, additionally, uh, I'm actually doing a, a config talk this summer in June, which is actually exactly about this. It's uh, titled Pitching Accessibility Like a Salesperson. So I'll have even more soon. Um, I think like the secret trick though, and the secret sauce, spoiler alert, is that you just have to start doing it. You have to start doing the work without permission. 
um, make the connections internally in your organization that you need to, uh, and then speak the language of the stakeholders that you're speaking to, um, find out the things that they're measured on for their performance and how they get promotions and how they get bonuses and uh, position accessibility to serve those things. Um, accessibility, especially when you're retrofitting, isn't a cheap thing. It's a hundred times more expensive to go back through and fix all of this mess that you've created for however many years your business has been running. Um, so you have to be sensitive to that and know that like you have to show that there will be a return on the investment because it is an investment. Um, but then also you can say, if we do this going forward, we save a hundred times the cost. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of angles to take there, uh, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, maybe just to add to what Trey already um, laid out. One, I would refer to the white paper. There's a lot of really great um, sources from really across the market and geographies in there that you can pull from. And we made it a point to, in addition to our own research to really pull anything that is relevant, latest regulation, um, you know, latest figures uh, and put it on the white paper. So take a look, we linked to all of the sources. So you should be able to, to find your way around. In addition to how you make it in your own company on top of what make the case in, inside your own company to in addition to what Trek already said is from my own experience, um, you can, um, depending on what your role is in the organization, um, make a business case based on, for example, your um, sales um, strategy and pipeline. And for example, if you're a company that is selling B2B, um, there's a very clear case, especially if you're selling into public companies or governmental organizations that you have to be accessible. So if you are not, or you can't prove it, then you can put a dollar figure on every single deal that you might lose out on or where you uh, lose renewal. And that is a very clear way of articulating um, you know, the value of the work that needs to be done. And you can, of course, triangulate that then with the cost of retrofitting and, and, and this and that. We also internally, when we talk and work with our enterprise customers, we, we have tools that we can um, calculate based on your own internal metrics of cost, um, and time spent on certain parts of the process, um, some some ROI, um, both in terms of dollar amount, but also in terms of time saved. So there's ways that you can make a, a true business case internally uh, once you understand, as Tarek was saying, what's um, moving your company, what is truly important. Uh, and going back to one of the things I said earlier, um, shifting the conversation in a company that is still looking for a true business case to... Um, accessibility being a non-negotiable quality requirement is hugely beneficial in that sense because you're removing, well, you're adding a dimension on top of the moral case that is absolutely right and important and, and truly the only thing that should matter to Kat's earlier point, but you're adding a dimension that, that speaks the language of the business, which is ultimately, of course, critically important. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I think um, the you guys covered it. So um, I'm going to jump to the next question. If I'm a developer building sites for companies and I want to make their site accessible, I want to specialize in accessibility. Would I be a good candidate to use Stark, uh, Stark's platform? Or is it more a platform for companies to use for themselves? If I'm a good candidate, what pricing plan would be best? Um, so Stark is for any individual or team. Uh, and that's how it's set up because we also realize that it's not just companies at enterprise scale that need to ensure their products are accessible. It's the, the individual change maker on a small team uh, at a small company or on a small team within a team of teams in large organizations that are these change makers that make a difference by starting to chip away at that accessibility debt that we talked about before. So as an individual, it's absolutely uh, set up for you to succeed. And then if you join an entire team of people, bring it on to them. Um, but if you want to give it a try, we have a starter plan there. Um, but if you want to actually capitalize on things like the automation and uh, the true organization and AI, uh, then give the premium plan a try. It's for 
you know, individuals or small teams that, uh, you know, want to capitalize on that. Um, and the great thing about that is, uh, you know, actually utilizing things like Sidekick in your workflow, have you working 10 times faster and are seeing about a, about a 50% reduction in accessibility issues, which is uh, fantastic. Hope that yeah. answers your question. And Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Just to, just to add real quick, um, you know, we, we have a ton of um, agencies as customers that are on um, what we call a business plan um, where they are, they may be a small but mighty team, but they work with a lot of large customers. And so having the real-time insights for them, um, making sure that things are being checked all through the process, having that, those reports that they can, you know, show um, and maybe even offered it as a service is certainly something that that we see quite a bit. Same with, you know, a lot of the, the B2B startups, you know, B2B um, market is booming, especially with startups. And as, as we said earlier, if you want to sell into B2B markets, accessibility is becoming a non-negotiable uh, requirement. So you want to have that in place. Um, and the, the platform that we offer can scale um, up or down, um, as Kat was saying. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're not too small or large to get started. Next question is from Kristen. Uh, more of a general question. I'm a UX slash UI designer, and I'm really struggling to get anyone to take accessibility seriously. We get it. Uh, are there any... Uh, sorry, Kirsten. Sorry, not Kristen. I'm sorry, Kirsten. Um, are there any tips on how to approach this? I've attempted from a legal angle due to talking to non-designers. Any tips would be greatly appreciated. Um, I've attempted from a legal angle. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in general, at least we found there's, it actually goes to the next question, but um, it does depend on the size of your company, who you're catering to, um, what the primary focus is, leadership, Right, we say at Stark, the fish rots from the head down. If your leadership fundamentally believes there's no business case for this and are completely ignoring it, then there's not too much, um, you know, that can be done. There's got to be some, uh, some movement or something that generates this uh, inertia to to get the company moving forward. And so it may be that the legal angle, if that didn't work, um, you know, if your company is very legal focused and are saying, well you know, there's nothing there in place for me to to really move on yet, um, then there's an argument to be had about taking more of a proactive approach to say, you're right, there's not one in place in this particular region yet, which is why we should be proactive so that we don't have this almost like this uh, GDPR-like uh, scattered, you know, shotgun approach, um, because that does get very expensive. Um and if you're talking to non-designers, that's certainly, you're not going to have an argument from an experience standpoint. Um, but then I would recommend, like we just discussed, talking about the ROI, the actual business case there. Um, and going more from the, here's the money we're losing. Uh, and here's the customers we're potentially losing, the money we're losing out on, the customers we're not, we're not able to, or the deals we're not able to capture because of this. Um, brand tarnish, right? Because it seems like if you're talking to non-designers and the legal angle didn't work, then having a conversation about morality probably isn't going to create the momentum and inertia that uh, that we hope in organizations. Um, ben, Treg, I don't know if you have anything, you know, additional to add there. Yeah, I, I would say um, you can talk to brand risk. There's obviously legal risk, like you said. Um, I really love the angle of talking about quality um, and how the the deeper you get into accessibility, the more you realize it's literally just UX. And if you're not doing accessibility work, you're not doing a portion of your job. And your thing is, um, if it's not accomplishing the goals for any portion of your customers, you're not delivering on your promises and then you're not doing your job. Um, so that's like the, the hot take spicy way to go. <laughs> if you have an organization that cares about craft, uh, talking about how not having accessibility as a, as a focus, uh, means you don't have craft as a focus. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's like, that's a risk too, because 
someone's going to come along and make your thing with a higher level of craft uh, and take the market share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, there's no, I'm reading the Q and a slash comments. No need to, to thank, uh, thanks for giving us your time. Um, and again, in any of these scenarios, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we, we love nerding out on all of this, obviously, uh, one would hope. Um, so don't hesitate. Uh, I know we're coming up on time. There's one more question that I want to get in. So if you need to go jump, uh, if not, we'll, you know, we'll hang back and answer this. So Kevin said, there's a wide range of customer experiences between managing risk through compliance and advocating for customer-centered quality. Your messaging addresses both lenses. How do you thread the needle so that broad communication doesn't muddy the waters and limit influence and impact? Ben, you want to take that? Yeah. Um... It's, it's such a, it's, it's a, before you jump, I just, Kevin, I just want to say, this, in so many ways, we're learning as we go, and uh, and 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 I think it's purely contextual, based on the the company uh, that we're dealing with. We've somewhat created this uh, this quadrant uh, where we can tell based on size and maturity and uh, prioritization of quality. And, and so on, whether or not the pendulum needs to swing in more of one direction than the other. Um, and I think we, uh, you know, in, in our digital, uh, digital lives now, we have this whole, you know, balance, balance, balance. Very, very rarely are you in complete harmony with anything. Um, so yeah, Ben, go for it. Yeah, um, maybe this is more um, because what Kat was saying is is the the way we determine where we start in the conversation. Um, but maybe to add uh, and kind of end with kind of more of a personal um, story um, from my experience um, before Stark, I was uh, an, an executive in two of the largest tech companies on the planet. And they were distinctly different, and I'm not putting any weighting or judgment on, on either one. Um, they were distinctly different in their take on accessibility. One was driven from the CEO down from a very deep human empathy perspective um, that not only was it the morally right thing to do, to do, but it was also good for business for many reasons. And that initiated a massive cultural transformation that manifested in very hard expectations for managers, NICs alike, to do things right. The other one, that was not the case. And what worked there, though, was um, to establish the business argument that we've laid out, where we can make the case of the number of deals that are at risk of being lost, the potential risk of lawsuits, and so on and so forth, which then um, positively led to drastic systemic change and the importance um, or, or the, the priority being put on accessibility as a quality requirement. So you have two ends of the spectrum in that story alone. Uh, and now to answer your question, the way we try to guide the conversation is we try to assess where on that spectrum um, a company or an executive or a leader falls so that we can equip them and the people that we talk uh, to with the right arguments and the right material and the right even like demos of the platform so that they can see themselves in that. Because um, at the end of the day, we are very mission-driven at Stark. We believe that um, the world um, needs to be accessible by default for everyone so that everyone can contribute their best. And um, it's our job to figure out how we get, get um, you know, company after company on the train and, and get them to see how this proactive approach that we've outlined is the only way that they can do that at the pace and velocity and scale of modern software development. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight as to kind of how we're thinking about it and a little bit more of a kind of 
attached to some some real life examples. All right. Thanks, Ben. And thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, we're going to call it here. We're already a few minutes over. Um, we'll be sharing the recording. Uh, we'll also share the white paper uh, with that. If you haven't read it or re read it uh, or received it yet, um, the link is here in case you want that. But having said that, this is a wrap. Thanks for everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.